The domain name system is a collection of servers on the internet that provide a service that converts human readable addresses into IP addresses. Um, for example, example.com. can be converted to an IP address 93.184.216.34. Okay, so previously we used the function dns.resolve to do this. And that's took in a human readable domain name and it converted to an IP address. This is required because computers only understand IP addresses, but it's hard for us as humans to remember that 172.217.3.206 is the IP address for google.com. And even if we could sort of memorize them all, that IP address could change. Okay, so typically IP addresses are least, but it's definitely possible to change them if you actually have to. For instance, if you change uh, your hosting provider. So typically your, your home router will be configured to use, uh, when, once you set up your home internet, it already has a default DNS server. And that's typically provided by your ISP. But if you go into the configuration settings, you can change it to any DNS server that you want. Um, there's a couple of sort of public DNS servers that are sort of widely used. Um, the three most common ones are the 1.1.1.1 IP address. And typically these comes in pairs. There's like a backup one as well. So it's 1.1.1 and 1.0.0.1. This one is hosted by Cloud, Cloudflare. Um, we have the Google hosted one, 8.8.8.8 and 8.8.4.4. This is the Google public DNS. And there's also one at 208.67.222.222 and 208.67.220.220. And this is uh, OpenDNS, which is another popular uh, DNS alternative from your ISPs. In addition, DNS can be used for other purposes. So be beyond resolving domain names, it's sometimes used for blocking as well. There's a collection of uh, DNS servers out there called the, the AdGuard servers, which I won't list over here as I don't have the numbers on me, but you can just sort of Google it if you're interested. And the idea behind these AdGuard servers is that DNS typically resolves domains. Um, and if it can't resolve a domain, it'll just send you a message that it couldn't resolve the domain. So if you try to resolve a domain for something like um, CS355 class um, 2020, dot com or something. Okay, so this domain probably doesn't exist. And so if you sort of type a domain that doesn't exist into your, your browser, then DNS will try to resolve it, but it's going to fail. If you use certain DNSs, like AdGuard in here, then for servers that they deem either malicious or just serving ad information, they will also treat it as if it were a domain that didn't exist. So it'll tell you that that domain doesn't exist, and then you'll stop sort of loading the content, which can be useful if you want to block ads. So typically what would happen is, 
what a typical connection sort of looks like is you have your client, you have your sort of content server. So I'll call this server. Okay. And then typically you might also have uh, ad servers. Okay. So typically you make a request for some web page on, on a server. They'll send you back that web page. Okay, so you get some uh, HTML file. And then inside of that HTML file, okay, when you get it, it will make requests to the ad servers, okay, where it collects um, the secondary information to display ads. So the idea behind this, sort of this DNS uh, ad block is that when you try to resolve the domain for the ad servers, then it'll return back um, that it could not find the, re the requested domain. Even though it does exist, it's just sort of pretending that it doesn't exist. And then because um, the document could not load the ad from the ad server, then you can get sort of the content without having to look at the ads. So that's sort of one way that we can sort of use DNS blocking. Um, but DNS blocking can be also used in the other way around, that it could be used for censorship. And so many countries out there already already use DNS um, as a technique to censor, um, so preventing certain domains that contain uh, information that they find questionable from sort of being resolved. So we need to know that there are four types of DNS servers. Those four types are the recursive resolver. This is typically going to be your ISP. And we also have a root DNS server. Uh, we'll have a top level domain or TLD. And then we have the authoritative. And then we have our computer. When our client tries to resolve a domain, dns.resolve m.example.com okay so the first the, the request itself is going to go to your isp or or whatever um, resolver you set up okay and this essentially passes the, the job over to the recursive resolver. The recursive resolver is actually the, the DNS server that makes all the requests. Um, and then when it's finished, it's going to respond back to our DNS clients. Okay, so the first step, um, we're going to assume that the recursive resolver has no information about this domain. Okay, none at all. And so the first step, if it doesn't have any information, is it's going to go to the, the root DNS name server. OK, so this is a collection of about 600 servers um, spread across 13 IP addresses. And these are known to all DNS servers. It's going to ask the root DNS name server, do you know where I can find the name server for .com? Okay, so this is what we call a top level domain. Okay, and so there's going to be multiple servers, um, ones that handle .coms, one that handles .orgs, one that handles .nets, and so on. The root keeps track of all of the top level domains. So it's going to send us back two records. One is going to be a NS record. OK, so I'll write that over here. And the key thing that the NS record is going to contain the TLD DNS server for the .coms. So in that case, this one is going to be a.gtld dash servers.net. Okay. And there's also an A record. 
and an A record refers to the IP address of a specific server. So I having just this domain is not really useful to it because then I have to resolve this domain. But the root server also has the IP address. Okay, so the recursive resolver, it knows its next step. Its next step is that it has to go over here if it wants to query the, uh, if it's looking for .coms. And because I'm looking for m.example.com, I need to query the next one. So this one is at 192.5.6.30. So I'm going to forward my requests. I'm going to extend it over here. Now I'm looking for example.com. Because we know that um, this TLD DNS name server is in charge of all .coms, okay, it's going to have a record for example.com if it exists. If it doesn't exist, then we'll get that message back and be sure that that uh, domain doesn't exist. Okay, so just like before, we're going to get back two records from this uh, name resolution. We're going to get back a NS record as well as the IP address inside of AA record. Okay, and so again, the recursive resolver, it's kind of one step closer. It knows the name server that um, is associated with example.com. And so it's going to need to query that um, name server as well. So our recursive resolver finally um, contacts the name server for example.com. And this time it's going to ask, where can I find m.example.com? Okay, so the authoritative server name server should be the one that handles everything for example.com. So any subdomains it should know about. And it's going to return back just the A record. So as an example, we'll use 94.20.20.20. And so once this information is received back, our recursive resolver now has the correct IP address. And it returns that information to us. So it's going to give us back that A record of 94.20.20.20. And also, the recursive resolver will also store that information onto its local cache, such that if we have another DNS client, okay, so we have another DNS client. So you can think about this as a different um, user that shares your same ISP. Okay, if they they make a request for the exact same domain, then I don't need to do all this again because I've stored the results, the previous results. Um, and so it's going to fetch the previous results and we'll get it back. So the columns inside of this table, inside of this A record, um, it's got domain name. got the record type so it's going to be a in this case it's got the value which is going to be the IP address and there is also a TTL okay and this is referred to in seconds i believe and it just re represents how long this information is valid for so that typically when you when you have a cache you you want to make sure to have some type of expiration date um and this essentially allows us to if uh, a domain changes its ip addresses then even after a even if we don't explicitly say to sort of point it somewhere else then on its own, it will sort of expire these old, 
old values. So typically, when you run through this process, you'll get back a single IP address. So it's possible for your A records to have multiple values inside of it. This typically happens if you have a um, authoritative server that is pointing to multiple servers. All of these servers have the exact same code running on them. And um, the process finishes quickly enough that we, we don't need to worry too much about sort of synchronizations resolver inside of here as well. Okay. So the authoritative sort of um, server is the sort of last step. And what's going to point to is initially it's going to send back a response that points to S1. Okay. So this client gets back the IP address of S1. And then from there, it can communicate. Okay, so now let's uh, assume a different uh, client. Okay, so we'll assume a different client using a different ISP. Okay, so a different recursive resolver. And Let's say again, they're querying the exact same websites. Okay. Now how round robin works is that because I chose S1 last time, I'm going to choose the next, um, the next server to resolve. The response that I get back is going to say that S2 is for, let's say, example.com. Okay, whereas before I said it was S1. Okay, and again, because all of these servers are running the exact same code, it doesn't really matter which one which one we choose. Okay, so over here, this one will go to S2. Right, if we had a, a third client, then it would use S3. Okay. And then once it finishes, it loops back up on top to restart. Uh, this technique is called load balancing, where you may have multiple servers, in our case, S1, S2, and S3. And you want to sort of spread out the traffic that they may get. Uh, so architecting your name servers in this way is one way to sort of scale your website such that the load is evenly distributed among each server.